in Philippians today, Philippians chapter 1, and um, interesting part of the world we live in here in Sofia, um, we could, uh, if the border was open and all was clear, we could be in Philippi in, in less than five hours, um, cross over at just south of Sandansky or, or go through Bonsko and down by Inland. Elin Den, I think it's called, and uh, come right into Philippi, not that far from here, which which makes me wonder if if even you know the, that that church, no doubt, they got up into Bulgaria. Uh, Plovdiv was called Philippopolis, you know, after the same you know Philip guy that, that Philippi was named after. But um, <clears throat> Anyway, the book of Philippians, we're going to be right, in, we're going to be in chapter 1, and I'm going to read the first 11 verses, and I want you to listen, and, and maybe count, how many times do you hear the personal pronoun, you? Just kind of, kind of make a mental note as I'm reading these verses. How many times do you hear the, the pronoun, you? And uh, so here we go, Philippians chapter 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making, for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart as much as both in my bonds, and then a defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. So, so did you count up the U's in there? Six. You got six? Anybody else? I lost count. I feel like it's more than six. I got, I got, oh, are we counting the E's, the A's? Well, just you. I, it doesn't necessarily have to be your, but... Um, Get the idea they're in there aren't they and I, I came up with nine times in 11 verses and and that tells me that this was a personal letter you know you in the english language it can be a, a singular to an individual or a group of people it can be plural and uh who are these people that paul was writing to what's this book all about and for the answer to that we need to go back to the book of acts uh chapter 16. And uh, this will really set the stage for, for the book of Philippians. So Acts chapter 16. And we know that Paul uh, was a missionary sent out by the church that was Antioch, at Antioch. And in, in the 13th chapter of, of this book of Acts, it says that church in Antioch, they fasted and prayed and uh, and they laid hands on Paul and Silas, and they sent them out through the, the work the Lord had called them to do. And as we read through the book of Acts, we find the three missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And on that second missionary journey is when he went to Philippi. But for time's sake, we're just going to go to chapter 16 and verse 8. And it says, they passing to Messiah came down to Troas. And... Troas is uh, very near to, to ancient Troy. You've read Homer's Iliad or, you know, the, the Trojan horse, all that. It's, it's, it's um, actually, you can drive there in about eight hours, I found it. Mm -hmm. um, go through Plovdiv and keep going. Um, and uh, what's, that, what's that count on the Turkish border? Well, yeah, you're DNU you after you get in, into Turkey, and then you just turn south and, and drive down the, the west side of the Dardanelles, ferry across to Chanukale, and, and it's about, about a seven to eight hour drive, and you're in, in Troas. 
Well, Paul got there a different way. And uh, at Troas, we know that he was, he just, he thought, you know, I'm going up into Asia, Bithynia. Um, but, but God had other ideas. And, uh, and that's what we read here in, uh, it said, a vision appeared to Paul in the night, verse 9. There stood a man of Macedonia, prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And, you know, we think of Macedonia as this country over here to our west, but in in, in this time, Macedonia is, is all that northern Greece area. And that's why there's so much contention between Greece and this little country over here about that name Macedonia, because because Macedonia is, is all that region, Kabbalah and Thessalonica. That's, that's what's Macedonia. So this... There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Just like Paul just knew it. It was just clear as day. This is what we need to do. And uh, they packed up and they headed for Macedonia. And uh, he's, verse 10, After we had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gather gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, so, so they're, they're in a sailing vessel, we came with a straight course to Samothracia the next day to Neapolis. And uh, Samothracia is still there. It's an island south of Alexandropolis. And, uh, and uh, Neapolis is Kabbalah. Kabbalah, Greece is, is Neapolis. And from thence to Philippi. So he... He would have got off his sailing vessel, went up over the, the, the hill, and down into this valley, this place called Philippi, and verse 12 says, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia in a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days, and then it was a colony of the Romans. And uh, on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a river where prayer was wont to be made. We sat down and spake to a woman, which uh, resorted thither, verse 14, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us, or, or took care of them. And uh, so we have this, this woman, Lydia, who the Lord, who the, whose heart the Lord had opened and and Paul, you know, met her there just on the outskirts of Philippi. It's uh, there by the river. And uh, Lydia, we know, was, uh, uh, we know her as that she was in the uh, textile industry. She sold fabric, um, uh, uh, seller of, I think the Bible says, seller of fine purple. You know, purple dye was very precious. And uh, interestingly, in, in Revelation, we know there's a church in a place called Thyatira, where Lydia came from. Did Lydia go back to her people? And did that was that the, the beginning of a church in Thyatira? I, I don't know. It's only only speculation. But so Lydia is one of these people that Paul is writing to in this church at, at Philippi. And then we come down in uh, um, uh, in verse 16, as it came to pass. As we went to pray, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit for divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. And uh, so I'd say this is probably a young woman who had been trafficked. You know, she had was being used for the gain of those who were trafficking her. She was telling fortunes. Who knows what all she was doing? But she mocked um, she was mocking uh, Paul and Silas, verse 17. The same followed Paul and us, cried out, saying, These men are, are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. That all sounds good. And, uh, and this she did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He came out the same hour when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace under the rulers, uh, verse 20, they brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city, each customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither observe, being Romans. And uh, we read in the verses, following that, that Paul and Silas were beaten, severely beaten and thrown into prison. And uh, so, but this young 
girl who I say was a slave being trafficked, she came to Christ. And that's that's another part of who Paul was writing to here in this church at, at Philippi. You know, Jesus changes lives. I'm, I've got a friend in, uh, he lives in Texas. His name is Joel Dillahunty. And uh, I met up with him in Israel about this time last year. And we went down to Tel Aviv where, I mean, the streets are just littered with, with needles. Um, the, the, there's a lot of Russians that have, that have came in, a lot of young men, and they're, they're absolutely addicts. I mean, the, the addiction, the prostitution, the things that are going on there, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, but you know, those people need the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and now, now Joel is in Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, that region, and, and he, he ministers around these abortion clinics, uh, just telling these girls, you know, there's, there's other options, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, Christ is for everybody. And uh, so we have this, this merchant woman, this, this girl who was possessed of a demon. And, but then Paul and Bart and Silas, they're in, in prison. And, and what are they doing? They're singing praises unto God, like we did here today. You know, they're, they're singing. They're singing about Jesus. And, and uh, there was an earthquake, and their, their whatever was binding them was loosened, and they were free. And, and of course, the, the jailer, the prison guard, was absolutely terrified. He said, just kill me because I'm a dead man anyway. Yeah. And then Paul said, no, it's okay. We're all here. And in the words of this Philippian jailer, as we call him, he says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul replied, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And uh, this jailer, he came to know Christ as his Savior. And, you know, we, we read on in Philippians, and, and Paul talks about a, a, a couple of, of women, uh, Philippians 2 and 25, uh, Philippians 4 and 2. He says, I beseech Yodia, beseech uh, Sinkaiche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Um, I, I get the idea that there were two women in this church that were maybe kind of, uh, maybe some friction or something. Paul says, I pray for these two that, that, uh, that they would be of the same mind in the Lord. He mentions Clement. He mentions, uh, a guy named Epap Epaphroditus who, uh, this church later, they actually sent Epaphroditus from their own congregation, sent him to Rome to minister to Paul. So, I mean, Paul knew these people. Paul knew Lydia. He knew this, this, this young woman who had been possessed of a demon. It doesn't tell us her name, but, but obviously he knew her and probably led her to the Lord. Uh, this Philippian jailer had a name. Paul knew him. Uh, Paul knew Clement. Paul knew Epaphroditus. Paul knew... Um, uh, Yodia, um, this other woman, real people with the real story being written. You know, when, when you talk about church, you know, what, what comes to mind? And I remember when the refugees were pouring in here from Syria, and, uh, you know, I invited some of them to church, and, and I remember after one service, one of them says, well, I want to see a real church. You know, like, I want to see the candles and the cross, and the, you know, I want to see the real church. I says, well, this is about as real as it gets right here. But, uh, you know, so there's this, what do people think? But, you know, this was, this, this was a church at Philippi. Real people with a real story. And um, so, as we see the origin of the church at Philippi, you know, we could write a story even about Sophia, no? Could we not? You know? Um, you know, Jeff and Grace were in Wisconsin, and 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 I, I may get all this wrong, but but you know they they went with couriers for Christ, and they went to Bulgaria, and they handed out gospel tracts and literature, and God burdened them to come, and and uh, you know, and and in time, Laura came to, came to services, and Kevin came to services, and Jim and Sherry and Grace came along, and Yvonne came along, and I mean. It's real people, and that's the Lord's work. And Ephesians says we are his workmanship. 
We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're like a, if we'll allow it, we're like we're like the clay in the potter's hands. You know, I I think about my life. I I finished high school and I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, for an education. But it was there that I met Sherry, and um, it's been uh, it's been quite a journey. Um, but you know, we all have our lives before us. I don't. No matter how old you are, if you think you're old or young or wherever, we all have. A life before us it's like a book that is being written and you know and if we uh, submit to the Lord I mean he, he just has great things he has great things um, like I, I think I've quoted this before CT studs guys and he wrote it he wrote a long poem many many lines only one life and I'm gonna read the last Stanza. He says, only one life. <laughs> yes, only one. He says, now let me say, thy will be done. And, and that's what the Lord told us to pray, isn't it? Um, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I know I'll say it was worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last and uh, you know there's so much truth in that and uh, Psalm 90 and 12 he says teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom and uh, I remember when, when the Lord really started working on my heart I my my job for about 19 years was was installing and servicing diagnostic medical equipment and uh I remember I was in Colfax, Washington, a little farm town, getting their cat scanner back online. And it kind of became old hat after a while. And, and I remember thinking, is, is this really all there is to life? I'm just going to, I'm going to drive down the road and I'm going to, I'm going to gonna get another one of these machines working again or make the customer happy. And, and, and there's all merit in that. You know, I, I looked at that like, what if, what if my child had to use this? You know, what if they're the one on the table? I want this thing working. I mean, it was an important job, absolutely. But but God had burdened my heart um, for the foreign mission field, and uh, I thought, you know, in light of eternity, you know, to be involved in the Lord's work full time or repair another machine. I mean. Where does it handle? And for me, it was like, okay, we're going to serve the Lord. And uh, not to say you can't serve the Lord wherever you're at. And, uh, you know, we all have our sphere of influences. You know, Kevin has people that, that he meets on a day that I'll never know. I mean, he knows people that I don't know any of their names. Uh, and Lori, at, at your school, uh, you brought you brought people here, you know, that, that I would never meet. I would never know. And uh, God will use us wherever we're at. And whatever we're involved in, but it's important that that we're serving Him. We're that our our eyes are on a bigger plane than just what's going on right now. Um, you know, like like those in in the Book of Hebrews. You know, Abraham looked for a, a, a another city, a better place. He was looking into eternity. You know, how is what I'm doing right now? How does it affect eternity? And uh, so this was a church at Philippi. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, unlike what that refugee came, you know, a church is not a building, okay? Uh, you know, what people may think, but truly a church is not a building. And, and the word that we see translated church is that Greek word ekklesia, mm -hmm. which means a called out assembly. Um, there's a... You know, we're going to meet here on Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. We've called out. We're an assembly. We're local. We're a body of believers. Um, a church is made up of people. More specifically, people that are born again, are saved, are redeemed, um, 
have came to Christ in repentance and faith and then have identified with Christ through baptism. You know, baptism is Baptist. We, we immerse people. I mean, we find a lot of water, and we put them all the way down, and we bring them all the way up. And the idea is that it's a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And that's, that's why we, 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 we baptize the way we do, rather than just, you know, sprinkle a few drops of water or a little picture over the head or something. So, so baptism is the, like the, the doorway to church membership in the books of, book of Acts. As many as were, as believed, um, were baptized. And, you know, the church just was growing like crazy, like 3,000 one time, uh, more and more of it. Um, so Paul wrote this letter to this church that, that he was very instrumental in, in their beginning. And, but when he writes the letter, a lot had happened. I mean, after he left Philippi, you know, the Bible tells us that he went to uh, some other places uh, like uh, Amphipolis and... There was a great discovery there, like, I don't know, in the past five, six years. There's some very important somebody is buried there. And they found this tomb with a lot of precious, so Amphipoli, Amphipoli Apollyon, and then on into Thessalonica. We know that he he was there for just three weeks and, and launched a work in Thessalonica, went down to Berea, where they searched the scriptures daily it sent those Bereans down to, to see if it was really so. I mean, that's not exactly what it says. But we know he went down to Athens and Corinth and Ephesus and back to Jerusalem. And he went before a, a trial down there in that area and finally was shipped off to Rome. And he writes this letter from a prison cell in Rome. And um, so here's what he writes. He says, Paul and Timothy... The servants of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's going to take a minute. I'm going to talk about servants, saints, bishops, and deacons. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, written to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. And uh, think about Paul, how he refers to himself. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. And you think of how he could have. I mean, here was, here was Paul educated by the best, by Gamaliel. I mean, he, he was probably Dr. Paul. You know, he spoke Hebrew. He spoke Greek. He spoke the language of the Romans of the day, I guess some kind of Latin, um, and I don't know what else. But, I mean, very educated. Um, he'd been around. He was a Pharisee. He could have said many things about himself, but, but he said, the servants of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 26, whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And uh, that minister, it, it comes from a Greek word, diakonos, diakonos, which, which means like an attendant or a waiter. It's like to attend to people's spiritual needs. Um, um, whoever will be great upon you, let him be your minister. Whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. And this really goes against the world thinking. It goes against our human nature. I mean, we want to get an education. We want a position. We don't want to be that, that servant. Um, but whoever's chief among you, let him be your servant. Um, and that word actually comes from, from a word called, Greek word doulos, which, which means slave. And I wouldn't want to be a slave. Uh, it's, it's not something that our human nature aspires to, but, but this is the teaching of Jesus Christ. And uh, he said, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister to give his life a ransom for many. And that is the life that Christ calls us to, is a servant. And uh, referring to Christ, Paul touched on this in Philippians 2 and verse 4. Um, he builds up to Christ. Uh, it's just 
the next chapter over in Philippians, he says, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And uh, verse 9, where for God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and things in heaven, uh, in earth, and things in earth and things under the earth. Christ became a servant, went all the way to the cross. We, we know that final few days on this earth, he, he washed the disciples' feet, showing uh, his humbleness, his, his servitude. Um, for them, but he, he went to the cross. And uh, <clears throat> I've got my notes, Matthew 22, and I'm going to go over there. <clears throat> Matthew 22. And this is where uh, this is where one of the religious leaders comes to Christ and he says, uh, and these guys were real caught up in, in the law and in every little part of it. And he says, well, what's the greatest? What is the greatest uh, commandment? And uh, verse 36, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like, like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So um, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, Jeff, Jeff talked about this even this morning, about, about this word love. You know, it's, what is love? It, it's a verb. It's a verb, and, and verbs mean action. Um, <clears throat> love. In, in Christ's instant, it was a huge sacrifice. I mean, he left. He left that glory of heaven and uh, came to this earth because there was no plan B. There was no other way. He went to the cross. He became that servant. Um, be a servant. Serve the Lord. Serve others. And, um, uh, you know, Paul said, we're servants. Timothy and I, we can call ourselves a lot of things, but we're servants. And, uh, I don't know, maybe that's, people ask me, Brother Jeff, they ask you, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what, I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that might be a good answer. Um, but I, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> servants. And then he talks about saints. So, so Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to the saints. And um, saints. Talks about pure, blameless, consecrated, set apart, and uh, say, man, that's not me. That's not me. But the only way we can be pure or blameless is through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Um, and the Word of God is very clear: all have sinned, there is none righteous, no, not one. And uh, so the saints. That Paul is addressing here at Philippi, none of them were voted into sainthood. Okay, um, they were saints because they came to Christ Jesus, repenting of their sins and 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 trusting in Him for salvation. Um, it was impossible for any of them to be good enough to earn the status of sainthood. Uh, it just wasn't going to happen. So when you talk about saints, we're talking about. Um, Talking about born again believers, redeemed in Christ, um, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb in Christ Jesus alone, in Him alone is salvation. And uh, so, how did they become saints? God declared them saints. And if if you know Christ is your Savior, if, if there's been a, a point in your life that you have you said, you know, I'm a sinner, I'm guilty, there is no hope. I repent of my sins. I trust in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. 
we're redeemed, we're, we're justified, meaning just as if I had never sinned. We, we have that, that righteousness imputed on us um, through Jesus Christ. And, and, and he could say, you're a saint. It's that simple. You're a saint. These people were ordinary people. They had jobs. They had families. They dealt with sickness. They, they struggled probably financially at times. Um, they, they probably said and did things they regretted. Paul addressed them as saints, born-again believers. Uh, you know, saints are named, I found 95 times or 94 times about that, in about that many verses. And in every case, the context is God's people. People that, that come to God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. That's the only way. So he's, he addresses this letter to these, these people, these saints, these saved people. And then he adds, adds to it, he said, uh, and the bishops and the deacons, he throws that one in. <clears throat> and uh, a bishop is like a pastor, an overseer, a shepherd. And, and the deacons are like servants, attendants. Um, not every church has deacons. Um, the first mention of deacons is in Acts chapter 6. You know, they had grown like, they were up into the thousands. And, and some of the Greeks were complaining that, that their widows weren't being attended to like the, like the Jewish widows. And, you know, the, the apostles were saying, well, why should we stop the work we're doing prayer and and our time in the word to essentially serve the physical daily needs of these people and and god said select in this case i think it was six wise men that were filled with the spirit and they they made made them deacons and uh, and uh Seven spirit-led men uh, who demonstrated wisdom and they were servants of the church, Acts 6, 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So these are the only two offices in a church that, that are ordained by God. And um, there are no other ordained offices. I mean, that's it. I had a good friend that was a, a missionary in Lithuania for many years. And um, he, uh, is that my phone, Sherry? Probably James. Maybe he grabbed out of my pocket, inside pocket. Sorry about that, guys. James always called me in church time. But uh, anyway, I had a friend in Joe Morrell in Lithuania. He came back. To the states, took a church, and he said, "I want to be a Acts six four pastor, meaning I want to give myself to prayer and to ministry of the word." And uh, you know, God blessed that church, uh, Mountain View, Arkansas, a town of I think it's like twelve hundred population, and they run about eight hundred people in service on Sunday. Um, uh, I mean, God has just blessed it immensely. He surrounded himself with great people. Uh, but devoted himself to, to prayer, ministry of the word, being a leader, being an Acts 6-4 pastor. But so bishops and deacons, and, uh, you know, Paul spelled out the qualifications for, for bishops and deacons, and uh, you can find those in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Um, I remember I got into it with, a, with another missionary here in Sophia one time. This woman says, you don't believe in woman pastors, do you? And I said, well, if you can figure out how to be the husband of one wife, go for it. You know? um, there are qualifications. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, given to hospitality, apt to teach. He goes on and on. And, and they're not merely suggestions, but, but they're qualifications. And a, it is an important job to be a spiritual leader. Um, but the point I wanted to make is there's only these two positions in, in, in the church that, that Christ established, bishops and deacons. And uh, pastors, of course, are servants of the church. They answer to God. And, and did, you know there's no higher authority? There's no other higher authority than the local church to answer to God. God didn't put all this with this hierarchy like, okay, we, 
we have a church and then we have a, uh, I don't know, uh, some other organization that all the churches are under this big umbrella and then they answer to the big guy that's at the top. That's not how, that's not how God set it up. It's Jesus Christ. And his church is like this one in Philippi. Uh, churches like this one that, that they're attempting to establish right here in Sophia. And uh, so, and as I told you earlier, Paul was sent out by that church in Antioch. Um, I'll just tell you, I was sent out by a church in Lewiston, Idaho. It started in the living room of our home. And about 10 years later, I, I walked up front one Sunday and I said, you know, I'm really burdened about going to Romania. And, and on the spot, they, they had a little... Uh, this big red-headed cowboy guy named, we call him Red, his name was Mike Warwick. He said, I make a motion we send Jim and Sherry to Romania. And, you know, Baptists, we have what kind of a, uh, we follow Robert's rules of order, you know, so there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? And there was a vote. And, and I said, you know, I just want you all to pray about it. Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, within the, Within just a, a vote, uh, a motion, a second, and a vote, we were on our way. And you know, by by Wednesday night, you'd have thought we'd died. It's like I think the reality was setting in. Like this this church of probably about fifty people were thinking, "What have we done?" You know. <laughs> and uh, but you know, God has provided for the last twenty years. God has provided, and and God works through His churches. Churches like this church at at Philippi. Churches like the church that, that sent us here as their missionary. Churches like the church in Wisconsin that sent Jeff and Grace here as their missionaries. And uh, that's how God works. And um, I'll just I'll, I'll wrap up in, in verse 2. He says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, you know it would be easy just to, just to pass over these verses, wouldn't it? Just like, let's just blow on by them. Let's get to the meat. Um, but think about this grace and peace be unto you from God our Father from the Lord Jesus Christ and we know that grace is receiving what we don't deserve you know the classical definition of grace is unmerited favor probably your parents showed you a lot of that um, I mean for every time you got you got punished they probably missed a whole bunch of times um, but God gives us what we don't deserve it's unmerited favor the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, grace and peace. And peace is that, that quietness and rest, which that was talked about this morning too. And, you know, there's, that's lacking. It's very much lacking. I mean, people are afraid. Our news media has us all scared. Um, quietness and rest and that's what I want grace and peace and it comes from God and uh, Ephesians 2 and 8 the, the verse before Philippians he says by grace are you saved by the unmerited favor of God are you saved how through faith not of yourselves it is the gift of God and we have that peace and it comes through Jesus Christ uh, to know Christ is to know Peace. And uh, I plan on getting through a lot more of this, but um, our clock is clicking up on the hour. And um, but encourage you to read through the book of Philippians. It's only four chapters. And uh, I don't know, perhaps we can organize a trip down there one day. I mean, like I say, it's five hours. Top of the car, let's go. Let's go see it. There's a there's still an old ancient theater. Um, they they have a place marked out. They says, "Well, that's the prison where Paul and Silas were." I don't, I don't think it is. But, you know, they need to put it there because um, <laughs> obviously everybody on every church is the worst prison. They say, "Well, there it is." Um, but anyway, and you know, there's some there's some church buildings there, but you know how old they are. The newest one is like fourth, or the oldest one is like fourth century. Um, but you know. There was a church here at Philippi in the first century. And uh, these don't get talked about, but it was in every way, in every aspect, it was a church. Yeah. It was absolutely a church. And uh, so, uh, anyway, perhaps we can run down there at some point and uh, go eat some Greek food and take it to Philippi and, and uh, watch.
why not? We almost did the long day, or but anyway, I just throw that out. But any other word today as I, I wrap this up? Any thoughts or comments? So, servants, pray you're a saint. And um, for those bishops and deacons, the only two ordained offices in a church, grace and peace comes through Jesus Christ. I hope you know the Prince of Peace. Let's have a prayer. Sure. Can you go in and help the, the house, church house, that is in one of the rooms. I mean, to be well in. To Chloe, for instance. I think that's in Corinthians. Oh, Corinthians, what? Or Colossians. And the church that needs no home. Yeah, they could have, they could have been in somebody's home. They could have been under a tree. Um, they could have been in a public square, perhaps. No, no. Could have been down by the river where they met. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and um, the interesting. I'll just one more verse here. I told you about this guy Epaphroditus. This church of Philippi, they sent him all the way to Rome to minister to Paul. And in chapter 4, he said, Paul says, I have all in a barrel. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. Um, this was a church that was in ministering to Paul. They they had a, a burden, a passion for lost souls. And uh, they were a church involved in more than just what they were involved in. And, th and this is the verse that everybody loves. My God should supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. But understand who this was written to. I mean, they were they were a giving people. And, uh, and because of that, I believe, my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Jesus Christ. Again, be a servant. He said, give. It'll be given like Luke 6, 38. Pour your life into somebody else. Tell somebody else about Jesus. And, uh, you know, this is kind of like uh, how to say it, about as organic as it gets. You know, we talk about church, but every bit of church. And uh, this is a model that was repeated over and over and over and over you see Paul writing to churches at the church that was at Ephesus, the church that was at Corinth, the church that was at um, Thessalonica. There you go. The churches of Galatia, there were many. If you go to Revelation, you see that the seven churches of Asia, all named by name. And uh, they were local bodies of saved people that were baptized agreed together that we're going to serve the Lord. And, and that is what a church is. It's not a building. It's those people. Anyway, we'll, we'll pick this up next time and um, uh, talk more about this letter. As I say, a very personal letter. Um, but it's nevertheless, there's much that we can glean from it. But let's have a prayer and we'll close out in this song. Shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, for this time, for each one that it took time out to, to just be in your house with your people and thank you for this time to open your word. We, we remember those that aren't here. We remember Kenneth as he recovers from his surgery. Uh, we just pray for a, a full recovery, a quick recovery, and be with Irina as she uh, uh, just takes care of him. And, and uh, we remember Owen and Sarah and uh, the others that have been here. And, just maybe be, just be with us through this week, and maybe be that that light that that might just we just have, have that opportunity to share you with, with someone out there this week. Uh, thank you for this time together, and I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.